Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Horror Mine. My name is Vic Shy, and this is The Scare Score, where I break down horror movies and rate them on how scary I think they are. In this episode, we're going over the 2019 Indonesian horror film, Impetigore. Written and directed by Joko Anwar, the film tells the story of a woman who returns to her home village and becomes entangled in its terrifying curse. I'll be breaking down the events that take place throughout the film, and our trusty scare percentage on the bottom left will be going up based on how effective the scares are throughout the movie. Impetigore is a brutal and relentless film that utilizes its folk setting to produce unique scares with the help of its engaging narrative and disturbing imagery. The film explores Javanese culture and is filled with great performances that make Empedagore a truly engrossing and unique horror experience. But how scary is it? Sit back and relax and join me as we explore Empedagore and tally up the scare score. Our movie begins by introducing our main character Maya and her best friend Dini, two toll booth workers both hoping to achieve more with their lives. Maya's toll doesn't have many cars passing through and she says a weird man has seemingly been stalking her for weeks. The weird man shows up right on cue and is staring intensely at Maya. He gets out of his car and asks Maya several questions as if he's performing a background check. The man takes out a machete that would make Jason Voorhees drool and begins chasing after Maya. There is zero context as to what's going on, which makes it all the more terrifying when he begins chasing after her. He cuts open a small scar on her right thigh and says, Just as he is about to kill her, a police officer shows up and shoots him right into the opening credits. Some time later, Maya and Dini have left their old jobs and opened up a clothing store at a market. I would love to tell you that their business is booming, but they rented a stall all the way in the back and are selling knockoff products. After the attack, Maya found an old picture of whom she believes to be her and her parents standing in front of a large house. She doesn't remember what her parents actually look like as she had been living with her late aunt since the age of five. Her real name is possibly Rahayu, something her aunt used to call her and the same name used by her attacker. Maya believes that if the large house belonged to her parents, she may be able to inherit it and put an end to their financial troubles. That's a nice thought, but what if they just so happened to take that picture in front of someone else's house for a nice background? If they took that picture in front of Cinderella's castle in Disney World, we'd be watching a completely different movie, perhaps even a little more disturbing. She finds a small piece of paper with Javanese script written on it which was lodged in her wound. She takes a picture of it before flushing it down the toilet. She heads back out into the market where all the shops are now closed. We get a pretty atmospherically creepy scene, especially because of the music. This also leads to one of a couple fake-out jump scares that I would normally be annoyed by if it weren't for actress Marisa Anita's wholesome comedic performance. The best friends hop on a bus heading for Maya's home village of Harjosari. On the bus, Maya sees a man looking back at her and reaching into a bag and probably thought she was going to be assassinated Yakuza style. She meets a man who is able to translate the strange piece of paper she found in her leg. He says it is a spell written in ancient Javanese which protects its carrier from evil spirits. However, the spell itself was written by an evil person. Maya then notices three little girls creepily standing on the side of the road. They get off the bus and must continue their journey by horse carriage. Not many people have heard about Harjosari because the village is very secluded. Luckily, they meet a pretty cool guy named Nano who agrees to take them to the village. Nano recently gave a ride to the village elder named Kisap Dadi, who was a very well-known Wayang performer. Originating in the Indonesian island of Java, Wayang is a very unique and traditional puppet theater performance. The puppets are visually intricate and are usually made from leather. They arrive at Kisap Dadi's house and are greeted by his mother, who tells them to come back in the morning. There is something clearly off-putting about her and she isn't exactly the most welcoming, as will come to find out. They find the house that possibly belonged to her parents, which appears to be the biggest house in the village, being significantly larger than the village elder's house. They break into the abandoned house which has been vacant for 20 years. 
Dini goes to pump water in the bathroom and doesn't notice the top of three heads poking out from the bathtub. I absolutely love the imagery in this scene. I actually had to rewind back to this scene because my eyes are failing me and I was really creeped out when I finally noticed the three heads. We then get a predictable fake out scare as Dini approaches Maya wrapped in a blanket. Maya finds several pictures of her parents and points out that she isn't in any of them. They observe the villagers escorting the body of someone who recently passed away. They head to the cemetery and find the graves of Maya's parents. Dini notices that the cemetery is eerily filled with the graves of nameless infants who died the same day they were born. As they exit the cemetery, they notice a couple of villagers staring at them intensely. I've played enough Resident Evil 4 to know that those villagers aren't too excited about seeing outsiders. They decide to spend the night in the house and Maya is woken up by a loud noise. We briefly see a little girl watching Maya and Dini sleeping from the next room. She wanders the creepy halls of the large house looking for the source of the noise. We see the glimpse of a little girl walking in the next room and Maya sees another girl right outside a window. She looks into the distance and notices all three little girls standing outside. Maya hears a woman screaming in the distance which we see is coming from a woman giving birth. This is where we finally meet the village elder Kisaptadi. To be honest, I was expecting someone a little more menacing. Right after giving birth to the newborn, Kisaptadi takes the baby and drowns it in water right in front of the father. We don't actually see the baby and the father simply stands there in tears. The next day, Maya once again sees the villagers escorting the body of whom we now know to be a deceased child. This explains the numerous children's graves in the cemetery and implies that this horrific act has been going on for quite some time. They follow the villagers into the cemetery where they meet Kisap Dadi. They tell him they are university students doing research on Wayang and he invites them to his house. Dini tells Maya that they need to leave immediately, sensing that they may be in danger as someone already tried to kill Maya, possibly in relation to the house. Maya insists that they first speak with Kisap Dadi and find out if the house truly belongs to her before they leave the village. Dini heads back to the house for a shower as Maya goes into town to look for something to eat. She meets a young girl named Rati who tells her the house was previously inhabited by devils who left behind a horrendous disease. While preparing for her shower, the camera zooms in on the bathtub accompanied by some pretty creepy music in the background, although this is just another fake out. Two men from the cemetery come knocking at the door and tell her that they aren't allowed to stay in the house. I never caught their names, so for the sake of convenience, we'll just call them Thing 1 and 2. Thing 1 says the house belongs to the female heir and that Kisap Dadi is waiting for her return to relinquish the house. Dini tells them that she is Rahayu and as the background music and his body language would imply, that was the wrong thing to say. They tell her that Kisap Dadi is at a nearby villager's house and can give her the documents to the estate immediately, because he always carries the legal documents to the house on his person at all times. They take her on a path through the woods using the lame old excuse that it's the fastest way and Dini begins to wise up. She tries to leave but they put forth their very best effort to make sure she doesn't go anywhere. She takes off running but trips on an inconveniently placed bamboo and breaks her ankle. She desperately tries to fight them off but they knock her out cold. Maya returns to the house and finds that Dini is no longer there. Gisap Dadi is now dressed in ceremonial clothing along with a Chris, a Javanese ceremonial dagger. Dini wakes up hung upside down with a bucket placed underneath her and finally understands the dangers of identity theft. Her upside down hair explains why the movie's poster looks like an R-rated version version of trolls, but still not quite as disturbing as the trolls themselves. She sees them lay out several instruments of torture and begs them to let her go. Kisap Dadi arrives with his mother and she nonchalantly slices Dini's throat. She says that there are two women going into labor and that they may still be able to save the babies. The way Dini struggles upside down as the life fades from her body was truly horrific. Maya goes looking for her missing friend, unaware of her terrible fate. Kisap Dadi tells her he will send someone to go look for her, and by look for her he means get rid of the evidence of her murder.
Well, that's one way to do it. In what is possibly the film's most horrific scene, Sapdadi's mother lays Dini's skin out to dry on a clothesline. The context and imagery in this scene are truly disturbing and accompanied by some very eerie music. Actress Christine Hakim is truly brilliant and menacing as Ki Sapdadi's mother, Nyi Misni. Nyi Misni's character was inspired by a woman from director Joko Anwar's dreams, who is a representation of his mother, whom he describes as having a strong character that sometimes scared him. Empedagore is actually the first horror movie Christine Hakim has acted in and she definitely steals the show. While she she manages to be terrifying in this role, Christine Hakim herself seems like an extremely kind and wholesome individual. When I read the script, I was shocked because this is my first horror film. I meet this lady. Who, sweet lady. Yeah, the sweet lady who give them the <laughs> right of their life. Speaking of being wholesome, Misni proceeds to make leather from Dini's skin and creates Wayang puppets out of it. Ki Saptadi uses the puppets to put on a visually stunning performance of Wayang. <laughs> A man in the audience tells his pregnant wife that their child is going to be okay. During the performance, Maya wants to ask Kisapdadi about Dini. Thing One tells her that they looked everywhere for her but couldn't find her. <laughs> which actually translates to we left no trace of your friend and your next. While not scary in the traditional sense, knowing that Kisap Daddy is performing using puppets made from Dini's skin is truly disturbing and scary in a deep, unsettling way. As the night goes on, Maya grows desperate in her search for her best friend. The spirit of a little girl suddenly appears and invites her to come watch a woman giving birth. If you look closely, you can see the bright yellow orbs trailing her as she walks, confirming that she is super supernatural. In a shocking revelation, we see that the baby is born without any skin. This was also the case for the previous child and Maya sees Kisapdadi drowning the baby. The baby's father is furious and accuses Kisapdadi of being a liar, as he was told his baby would be born healthy. He quickly learns that you don't diss Kisapdadi in his own village. Maya is rightfully shocked by what she witnessed and accidentally makes a noise which draws out thing one and two. Rati suddenly appears to hide Maya and takes her to her home. Rati tries to assure Maya that she isn't like the other villagers. She reveals that the village is cursed and that all the babies are born without any skin. The village once had a wealthy elder named Ki Danawongso, a brilliant puppet master who married the most beautiful woman in the village, Nyai Sinta. Nyai was initially unable to get pregnant but managed to do so after five years of trying. However, the baby was tragically born without any skin. As a result, Ki Danawongso began to isolate himself from the other villagers. Soon after, three little girls went missing from the village and were never found. Some time later, Ki Danawongso's daughter finally emerged and looked perfectly healthy. Her name was Rahayu. The villagers suspected that this had something to do with the three young girls who went missing and that Ki Donawongso was responsible. Ki Saptadi says that Ki Donawongso was practicing black magic and made a pact with the devil to protect his daughter. One night during a Wayang performance, Ki Donawongso went mad and killed several villagers, including himself. One of his servants took Rahayu and fled to the city, presumably the aunt Maya mentions earlier in the film. Rati says that the Babies of the village are not allowed to live to save them from a life of pain and misery. Only one child was spared and now lives alone in the forest in constant pain and agony. Kisaptadi says the only way to lift the curse is to kill Rahayu and make puppets out of her skin. One of the main inspirations for Empedagore was director Joko Anwar's brother telling him a story when he was young that Wayang puppets were actually made from human skin. The skinless babies tie in directly to the film's title, Empedagore. Gore. Empedigo is a contagious skin disease most commonly found in children. Empedigo is combined with the word gore, which is seen plenty throughout this film. During Rati's story, Nyimisni is busting out some pretty smooth dance moves, showing that she truly is a jack of all trades. As Thing 1 and 2 try to figure out what went wrong, Nyimisni realizes that they didn't actually kill Rahayu. <laughs> Maya notices a picture on the wall of the man who tried to kill her in the beginning of the film. Rati says the man is her husband who went to the city three months ago in search of a cure. 
she places Maya's hand on her belly and reveals that she is also pregnant. And things just got a whole lot more awkward. This explains that her husband didn't truly want to kill Maya but became desperate as he did not want his child to fall victim to the curse. Rati knows that Maya is actually Rahayu but does not believe that killing her will end the curse. Her shaman grandmother says that the curse created from a pact with the devil can never be reversed and can only transform into a different curse. The entire town has turned into an angry mob that are now searching everywhere for Maya. A couple villagers come knocking on the door and this is where Maya learns about Dini's fate. The crude men threaten Rati with sexual assault because her husband has been away for so long. She grabs a knife and threatens to end her own life and haunt them forever if they do not leave. They must have just seen my videos on the Juan series and realized that they don't want to mess around with all that. Maya contacts Nano for help and says that he is on his way to the village with a police officer. If Nano and that guy on his motorbike are her only chance of escape, I don't really like her odds. <laughs> Right before her daring rescue, Maya feels that it's the perfect opportunity to tell Rati that her husband is dead. I probably would have waited until after I was rescued and sent a letter through the mail. Hey, thanks for helping me out back there and about your husband. <laughs> Nano arrives with his backup and is greeted by the mob. The police officer reveals that he is actually a resident of the village but that his fellow villagers are actually very friendly despite the fact that they're all holding torches and machetes. He shows him just how friendly they are by shooting him in the head. They try to call Maya's cell phone but she quickly tosses it away and takes off running. She manages to stop and hop in the back of a car that conveniently happens to be driving through a secluded village in the middle of the night. There also happens to be a not so convenient ghost in the front seat that tears off her face and causes the car to crash. This scare really caught me off guard as up to this point there hadn't been a ton of ghost scenes which made this one so much more effective. The spirits of the three dead girls suddenly appear and show Maya the true events that created the curse. We learn that Nyai Sinta was actually in love with Saptadi but married Kido no Wongso for his wealth and status. They had an affair behind his back which is how she managed to become pregnant as Kido no Wongso was unfortunately shooting blinks. This means that Kisaptadi is actually Maya's biological father. Niemisni was a family servant of Kido no Wongso at the time and discovered the affair. In an attempt to cover it up, she cast a spell using black magic to erase Kisaptadi's memory of the affair and kill the illegitimate baby. However, instead of getting rid of it, the spell caused the baby to be born without any skin. After his baby was born without skin, Kido no Wongso kidnapped and killed the three young girls. He made puppets from their skin and buried their bones underneath his house. He performed with the puppets as a sort of dark ritual and Rahayu was cured of the disease. Rahayu translates to good health which is possibly why the villagers only learned of her name after she was cured as that is when she was given the name. Rahayu was being being haunted by the spirits of the three girls as her good health was a result of their deaths. Kido no Wongso wrote a spell on a small piece of paper and placed it into her skin to repel the spirits of the girls. This explains why the man on the bus said the spell was written by an evil person and why Maya is now seeing the spirits of the dead girls. We then see Thing One knocking out Kido no Wongso in his home and saying the phrase blood for blood. This leads me to believe that one of the girls killed by Dono Wongso was Thing One's daughter. Thing One and Two are so willing to help capture and kill Rahayu because they have both been personally impacted by the curse. We see that Kisaptadi pretended to be Kido no Wongso during a Wayang performance and killed several of the musicians to create the illusion that Dono Wongso became mad. Saptadi killed Dono Wongso and made it look like he sliced his own throat. He also killed Nyai Sinta, whom he only knew as Dono Wongso's wife because his love for her was erased by the spell. The audience observed the killings as shadows behind the curtain and did not truly know what happened. This scene was Joko Anwar's reflection on society as he says society often views things from the shadows without knowing the full truth. Maya is told by one of the girls that burying their bones with their skin will end the curse. This unsettling dream sequence shows that the villagers have been told a distorted version of the curse's origin. This was undoubtedly orchestrated by Nyi 
Amy Snee, who wanted to ensure that no one would ever find out that she was responsible for the curse on the village. Rati once again comes to Maya's rescue and they pay a visit to Tole, the cursed boy who lived. That guy's not defeating Voldemort anytime soon. Maya asks Rati why she is still helping her and she replies that hating Maya won't change anything. Rati is such a great character. There was a couple of times where I thought betrayal was on the horizon, but I'm glad I was wrong. Maya retrieves the puppets from Kisapdadi's house and buries them with the bones of the dead girls. The spirits of the three girls disappear and finally move on. Though she can't actually verify that the curse is lifted unless another baby is born. Good thing that this is a movie and a woman is going into labor tonight, otherwise we'd be waiting 9 months for an answer. Nii Miss Nii walks into the house and says that she also had an affair with Ki Dono Wong So's father while she was his servant, meaning that Sapta Di and Dono Wong So were actually half brothers. Maya tries to defend herself from the villagers but is knocked out by Thing 2. She wakes up hung upside down and begs Kisapdadi to spare her life. She tells him that she lifted the curse and babies will no longer be born without skin. She drops the bombshell that she is actually his daughter and that Nyi Misni is responsible for everything. He seems pretty easily convinced and tells his mother he is tired of her controlling his life. Nyi Misni holds a knife to her own throat and forces Kisapdadi to choose between his daughter or his mother. Just as it seems he is about to kill Maya, Rati suddenly appears with a healthy baby, proving that the curse has truly been lifted. Kisapdadi and his mother slice their own throats in shame and die in each other's arms. Thing One looks down at them thinking, I'm not doing that. Rati cuts Maya down and says that she must leave. Maya asks her to come with her but she refuses, saying her life won't change no matter where she goes. Possibly meaning that she doesn't believe her life would be any better off in the city as opposed to the village. A sentiment echoed by Maya herself who said that she had been miserable all her life. As the villagers embrace the first healthy baby they've seen in 20 years, Maya runs off and waves down an oncoming vehicle. In a scene that pays homage to the ending of Toby Hooper's Texas Chainsaw Massacre, Maya hops into the back of the pickup truck, crying and laughing hysterically as it drives off into the distance. One year later, we see a new happy couple in the village who are excited about their soon-to-be healthy child. The wife goes into the bathroom where we see the ghost of Nii Mis Ni in the mirror. The husband hears his wife's horrifying scream and sees her in the bathroom, no longer pregnant and surrounded by blood. In the film's final scene, we see Nii Mis Ni feasting on the unborn baby from the mirror. As previously stated by Rati, a curse made through a pact with the devil can never be reversed and can only transform into a new curse. While Rahayu's curse may have ended, it has given birth to Yimisni's much more horrifying curse as the movie ends. <laughs> And that, ladies and gentlemen, was Empedagore. This was a truly brilliant and different kind of horror film. The unique folklore setting that highlighted Javanese culture made for some pretty terrifying imagery that viewers aren't likely to forget anytime soon. Though not the scariest film in the traditional sense, Empedagore manages to grab a hold of the viewer and took me along for a ride that kept me on the edge of my seat the entire time. While the engaging narrative was definitely the main focus, the film still manages to have plenty of great and memorable scary moments. Most of the scare factor comes from its disturbing and unpredictable story, giving Empedagore a solid scare score of 65%. The scariest scene of the film has to be its final scene. The moment I saw the happy couple and the pregnant wife, I knew they were in for something truly disturbing. The revelation of the horrifying new curse, seeing the terrifying spirit of Nii Mis Ni and the wife's screams of agony really tops the scare factor of everything else shown throughout the film. Empedagore is one of the best horror films I've seen in recent memory. I definitely recommend it to any horror fan looking for a different and truly unique horror experience and it is currently streaming on Shudder. But as all always, I hope you all enjoyed the video. Thank you all for tuning in and I cannot wait to see y'all right back here in the Horror Mine. Y'all stick around.